Here we go with 8.4, life during the Depression. Impact on minorities and women, significant, always an issue throughout our course. Uh, how are things changing or not changing for those categories of people? Dorothy Lang, significant in chronicling what's going on with life through her photographs. Uh, a little bit of a pioneer and influencer of the development of documentary photography uh, in the early days and just littered with the uh, country with uh, photos that showed what was going on on a daily basis. And again, every economic downturn you have, there's always the greatest impact and pressure felt on minorities, women, and children, as this cartoon reflects. We'll cover that one a little bit later. Back to the agricultural and farming, this is always a topic that comes up also. There are about 400,000 farms that were lost during the Depression. Farm families tend to be a little big, four to six people in a farming family. It takes kids to help do a lot of that work on the farm. And uh, let's say it's average of six, maybe it's five, somewhere in there. Even if you put it four, we got the big numbers. But you do the math, that's 2.4 million people. But within each and every little small town and community, there are businesses that are feeding off of that agricultural activity. The local grocery store, machinery, machine company, seller, salesman, uh, insurance, bankers, people selling all kinds of buying and selling all kinds of things there, uh, local grain elevators, uh, feed stores, that kind of thing. And if you figure they've maybe got an average of four people per family, well then you've got some pretty massive numbers of people that were affected uh, economically here during this time period. What you see here in particular uh, in this photo is uh, a sale on a bankruptcy foreclosure sale on a farm and selling everything you could possibly imagine on that farm. Pails, shovels, cows, machinery, everything goes to try and recoup what's lost by the bank. And of course bank runs, we talked about that. Uh, people running to their uh, bank to get out, pull out money before it goes bankrupt. Uh, it is a psychological depression that's going on here. Suicide does increase during this time. You have people roaming the countryside and uh, hobo culture kind of develops in which people are jumping on trains and moving to the next town trying to find work, living under bridges, so on and so forth. Uh, not uncommon to see that at all. Uh, and uh, it, the most important thing that a person really could have during this time was probably if you had one, you really wanted to keep hold of that, keep, uh, keep hold of this thing, and that was the car because it was your home and it was your wheels to get to another spot where per perhaps you heard there was some work to be had. And so people held on to those if they possibly could. Unemployment, massive numbers, 1934, 35, some of the worst, usually the worst impact of the unemployment and depression was felt in our nation's cities. Uh, families break apart, abandonment of families, uh, rural America, Appalachia America, uh, extreme poverty, good number of deal, New Deal programs will try to bring technology and jobs out into those areas that just hadn't had it. Soup lines in major cities, trying to give direct uh, uh, nutritional assistance to people there at that point in time. Uh, and, uh, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon to see people digging in garbage, or if you're further out in the countryside, people raiding gardens, or maybe a knock on the door and someone saying, you know, I'd be willing to paint your fence, or do you have any jobs for me to do if you could just give me a meal, a uh, place to stay for the night, that kind of thing. People were pretty happy with doing that kind of thing for a while there in some scenarios and some situations. Uh, but not everybody loses their job, of course. Uh, not everybody needed relief. Most Americans just do with less. And again, most farm, uh, suffering in the most difficult times were in the massive population centers in the cities. Uh, farmers going into bankruptcy, also a big issue at this time, as I mentioned before. Uh, but some farmers also were able to get by in terms of food because you tended to grow your own food if you were on the farm. But family, uh, families pulled together by, uh, you know, consolidating into one household. Uh, extended families come into one, under one roof. Uh, women go out to work and do other odd side jobs as many as they possibly can. Uh, salaries, of course, are less during this point in time, and especially, of course, for women. Uh, but if you had a home, one of the ways in which you made some money was to basically make your home, if there's just another room to be had, uh, to uh, make it a boarding house or uh, a room to rent to somebody that needed a place to stay. That particular uh, woman would also then sell their clothes, make them food, and that kind of thing in exchange for some rent. Canning, baking your own food, that kind of thing, very common at that time. And in fact, it increases. Do without and make your own kind of stuff. For women in the grand greater picture of things, uh, whenever there's uh, stress, 
wars or economic stress like this, especially this one in particular, women do kind of get involved a little bit more, and FDR is a bit of a groundbreaker with that. Frances Perkins, as we saw, is the first woman to serve in the president's cabinet. He appointed 100-plus other women to public positions. Uh, the first woman senator is elected to Congress for the state of Arkansas in 1932, and of course we have Eleanor Roosevelt being our first modern first lady going out and traveling the countryside and reporting back as to the condition of women minorities and other humanitarian concerns that uh, were out there at the time. So Native Americans, uh, his, the EOC course and one of the themes in history is how do things change or not change over time, and this is a perfect example of that in a high ticket topic that could possibly show up on the exam at the end of the year. Uh, that is uh, the condition of Native Americans on reservations. The new head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs pushed for reforms in what would become kind of known as the Indian New Deal to try and stop the sale of reservation land. Uh, 77,000 Native Americans got jobs through the Civilian Conservation Corps, which kind of fits it. Civilian Conservation Corps working out in the environment in the countryside to uh, save and restore our natural resources. The Public Workers Administration gave funds for new schools on reservations, and this Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 restored the opportunity for Native Americans to establish their traditional tribal governments, councils that they, you know, for generations prior to the Dawes Act in 1887, uh, would basically make decisions for the community and for the village. And uh, with the Dawes Act, that was basically taken away. Uh, the land that uh, was established under the Dawes Act, was, or the ter reservations under the Dawes Act, were no longer held together as a tribe, but then they were divided up into plots of land for Native Americans to become farmers on and to live more the Western lifestyle and to uh, forget their culture and assimilate them. This uh, Indian Reorganization Act also uh, allows for land purchase to basically buy back some of the territory and land that was sold under the Dawes Act. Uh, if it wasn't given to a Native American, it was up for sale to whites, and so therefore, under the Dawes Act, and here it is, our question, this is ended by the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. And so Native Americans do see some increased sovereignty control over their lives and independence with the New Deal. Hispanic Americans, migrant workers, and farmers from Mexico felt that quite a bit of resentment as the economic economic uh, pressures grow, uh, Americans uh, start to push these people out. Competition for jobs, encourage them to go back to their homeland. Um, white Americans want their jobs, basically, and uh, a lot of them get sent back or pushed back to the United States during the Great Depression. When World War II comes around, uh, we will be opening our arms for them to please come back to help win the war. And then when the war is done, we'll see the same thing happen again. The message will be, get out. In the 1920s and 1930s, the trend that was going on since the Reconstruction, the last part of the 19th century, century especially into the 1890s, was this lynching phenomenon. As segregation grew with Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, uh, violence and pressure to keep uh, African Americans in their place uh, was applied through lynching and lynch mobs. Uh, Ida B. Wells, a progressive reformer, uh, and other reformers had consistently pushed for a federal anti-lynching law that would allow the federal government to have more power to go in and prosecute uh, people using this method uh, and the violence against African Americans. Um, similar to the Ku Klux Klan Acts uh, in 1870-71, but uh, there's not going to be any push here for this kind of thing to happen from the democratic, the liberal-minded side of the, of the political spectrum. Now, consider this. FDR was a Democrat who had two-thirds of a majority of Democrats in Congress, and you would think he would be able to maybe get this kind of legislation to go through, yet it was never introduced into the Congress. And the, the reason behind it, him not introducing that was because the Democratic Party is strong in the South, and if he proposed something that would be along the lines of civil rights and civil liberties, they might not support the New Deal program. So the civil rights, civil liberties for African Americans, again, just like the progressive era, since the end of the Reconstruction, 1877, it's put on hold. We'll revisit the same issue, political pressure uh, over civil rights again in the 1940s and 1950s. In terms of the Agricultural Adjustment Act, uh, 
things didn't work out so well for African Americans either, in the South especially. Uh, this, again, if you remember, gave subsidies or money to farmers to not plant crops so that it would decrease the supply of crops being produced, which would increase the price because there's fewer, uh, lower supplies of the crop out there. And since white landowners were getting and owning the land and getting this money, then they had no need for sharecroppers or tenant farmers. And some of these tenant farmers, sharecroppers were also whites as well. And so if you didn't own land uh, in the South and farming was your thing or sharecropping, tenant farming was your thing, uh, it, it hurt. Uh, and so, again, another example of African Americans in the South having some pressure and not a lot of help here with the NRA and the Agricultural Adjustment Act and subsidies going on to the South. You don't have this in your outline notes, but one of the key things that really came out of the New Deal in terms of history and understanding what went on in for life for people during that time and in previous time periods was this Federal Writers Project. Uh, they went out and they sent out an army of uh, interviewers uh, to ask questions of former slaves, of tenant farmers at the time. Uh, Bill and Ellen Thomas, for example, uh, getting their voices down on tape, on tape uh, and finding out what slave life was really like. Absolutely invaluable, massive mountains of, mountains of information from uh, these people came about because of this travesty, the, the Great Depression and the New Deal. And so there were some positive things from this that are absolutely invaluable. African Americans uh, had some involvement with the New Deal, of course, uh, at this point in time. Uh, in the North, they're able to vote. There's some violence yet. In the South, not so much. There's no anti-lynching law. There's Roosevelt's Black Cabinet uh, that has formed kind of like his brain trust, a set of advisors for African Americans to hear their voice and their concerns and things of that nature uh, is formed. And so they do have some political connections uh, and gains to the White House and into the inner walls of the White House. I guess that would be how we would describe the political gains here in a sense, not very real, uh, but uh, some access to upper levels of government here uh, and access to the presidency. Uh, civil rights, civil liberties, I guess, again, just not really there at all. Migration does continue since the Industrial Revolution and with World War I, people moving to the north all over the place for jobs in the 1930s as well. Jobless rate still remains high. This creates tension also in the 1930s uh, for job competition as these people move in the north. A significant Floridian, Mary McLeod Bethune, was part of that African American uh, black cabinet. Uh, she is a co-founder of and founder of Cookman College in Daytona, Florida, which initially was Daytona Educational and Industrial Training School in 1904, uh, kind of like the Booker T. Washington Tuskegee Institute, uh, meant to train uh, people into something other than sharecropping, other than the dependency on their usual service and agricultural jobs uh, that they had traditionally worked. Radicalism, again, grows in the United States because of the economic stress. As it was going overseas, uh, the overseas ideas coming from Nazi Germany and also the communist world uh, proposing challenges, to ch changes to right economic injustices and argue that capitalism and or democracy was a failure uh, develop. Uh, in 1936, the German-American Bund was formed uh, as an organization to, and with this is with coming with encouragement from uh, the Nazis in Germany, uh, to extol German virtues and to encourage everything German. And they would have rallies and meetings and marches down the street. For example, this one in downtown Chicago, uh, in the Northeast, in Madison Square Garden. Multiple events, all kinds of events where these uh, organizations and little parades and ceremonies would be held to uh, commemorate German culture and German, German virtues. Uh, and in a way, it was meant to undermine capitalism and democracies in, in the West. And uh, in particular, this meeting in Madison Square Garden in New York City, uh, with George Washington at the center, center, labeling him as the first fascist and democracy is a failure and all that kind of thing. Entertainment and the arts were big at this point in time. You would consider maybe that since there's not a lot of money, people wouldn't be going out to the movies or going to baseball games. And the opposite actually was true. They actually went to them more uh, as a way to escape uh, the scenario that they were in, the situation that they were in, and movies and film and, and such and media and entertainment uh, latched on to themes that were all about escaping the real world, that, that were light and romantic entertainment type themes, 
uh, to help people forget about their problems and to help them cope with the hard times. And sometimes the themes in the stories kind of mimicked and re related to what was actually going on in real life, the Wizard of Oz being one of the big ones here at that time. And radio, uh, millions and millions of people chimed in on, on the radio. It's just like the 1920s, it continues on into the 1930s. Daytime dramas, as we know, eventually they become called soap operas because of the laundry detergent ads there, of course, targeting women in the homes during the daytime. Uh, that kind of thing were very popular. Uh, adventure programs, variety shows, the Groucho Brothers uh, comedy, slapstick comedy uh, duo there uh, were one of the big ones that continue on into the 1940s as well. At the movies, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves was the big hit, about 85 million people weekly. There's no TV, there are these little shorts that give people little newsreel in pieces of information about what's going on at the time, as well as with the New Deal. Shirley Temple was the big star, The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, 1940 with Henry Fonda, Gone with the Wind, Civil War, Reconstruction, uh, American Culture, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, as I mentioned, 1937, the first full-length feature color film, and of course The Wizard of Oz in 1936, working backwards there. In terms of writing literature and painting, they did what was going on. They focused on what was real in life. Uh, John, St John Steinbeck being the most important one, uh, at least later on, uh, looking, reflecting back, uh, highlighting uh, things with what's going on with Africa, uh, with uh, American farmers out in the Great Plains, which we'll cover here in just a second. Uh, photographers listed there, as you can see, their focus was really on the misfortune of the poor, southern farm families, the play of the farmers, migrant workers, that kind of thing. Social injustice, kind of a big theme and push about, you know, America has a massive population of the forgotten man and woman, and the government is just ignoring it, kind of a theme. And one of the key people that comes out of this time is a guy by the name of Woody Guthrie. We'll check him out in class a little bit more. Uh, he is the first uh, singer, songwriter, political activist, make a statement kind of a dude that we're maybe more familiar with today, but also is going to be heavily influential for those singer-songwriters of the 60s and the 70s in the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, he was from this class of people from rural America uh, and sang about the experiences there in particular the Dust Bowl. And speaking of the Dust Bowl, The Grapes of Wrath, this John Steinbeck book that's made in the film in 1940, uh, uh, is, is a massive piece that uh, highlights that theme of the forgotten person and what life is like for the common person. Uh, the Dust Bowl is a significantly important topic we need to know. Uh, it's the largest human-related uh, human natural disaster in U.S. history. Uh, it's exacerbated by drought and storms uh, and really occurs because of that, partly uh, that it will black out the sky and create tornadoes that will be just full of black dirt, uh, and it's in that section of the country that it's occurring that you see right there, Kansas, Oklahoma, northern Texas, eastern Colorado, New Mexico, but the dust is blown up into the outer atmosphere, and then it'll blow west, excuse me, east to Washington, D.C. It'll be, the dust and dirt will land on cars enough where people have to brush the dust off of cars in, in eastern cities and even land on ships on the Atlantic Ocean. Massive amounts of dirt and soil being kicked up because of this event. So why is it that this is happening? Well, we're going to talk about some of those factors here, but uh, the human factors are that you know, uh, thousands of farmers become bankrupt. They move to California and they become migrant farmers. A lot of them, the famous route, the infamous route 66, uh, was often traveled for people going in that direction. Some of them moved north into other plain states to try and find crops to pick by hand uh, to basically be tenant workers, migrant workers like Mexican Americans. Again, this would be a reason and a factor in an event that, if you note off to the side, you get this great, uh, great dust bowl. Now, white farmers might need work, and they want the jobs that Mexicans are taking and Mexican Americans are taking down here in the South or had been doing in the South. Uh, to, to feed themselves and to, to make a living on. And so uh, the Okies in the Oak, Oklahoma is one of the biggest and hardest, most heavily hit places. And these are quite often they're not only just farm owners, but they're tenant farmers, sharecroppers as well that are being pushed out. So why is this happening? This is happening because of poor, poor farming practices from the east. And Unit 2, the west, we talked about dry farming, where they would plant the seed a little deeper and maybe they wouldn't uh, plow up. They would try to keep some, 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 uh, some some uh, stuff that other stuff on the top that would uh, keep the dirt from blowing away, but really with technology, 
uh, and the plow and gas tractors, they're going to till up so much that the roots that hold this soil, drier soil, in place uh, is going to blow away when there is very little or no rain, a drought condition like it happens in the 1930s. And so it literally blows and washes away if there is any rain at all, it just disappears. The topsoil feet of it in many places are completely gone. And so World War I is a big factor in all this. And the Homestead Act, if you would annotate that maybe down here, it starts way back then. It's been going on for decades and with World War I and the push to get to production up to win the war, farmers take out those loans to grow the crops when wheat will win the war kind of a thing. It just devastates it. Uh, and literally, this, these dust storms were deadly. They would kill animals and chickens and pigs, and the dust is so fine it gets in your lungs and it would cause you to suffocate. Uh, and uh, it is heavily dangerous. Once in a while you see it happen again, but not to this degree. So that wraps up our lesson here today on the life of the Great Depression and the impact on women and minorities. Make sure that you put your snap chart on the left hand side. That's a simple one you could do. Pull it in and review some of the things we talked about here in the notes and or go into the textbook on the page you see there. Talk right in a few more things. A little reflection. You're done. Good to go. Make hay. See you another day. Bye-bye.